Good morning, Yekaterinburg. How are you folks doing? So the fourth industrial revolution envisions an industry that is rich of data, an industry that is smarter, and it also envisions an industry that is hyper-connected. Connectivity can be a competitive advantage during the fourth industrial revolution. My hope today is to use Uber as an example to inspire you folks to look at connectivity as a competitive advantage and also as your friend and not as a foe because these connected things are coming. A little bit about me. So I started moving from building technology to consulting about technology and doing some marketing on tech to doing sales in tech and had a tech startup. And I've been doing partnerships and, uh, for a while. And I sit on some boats and based in San Francisco, California. So to explain connectivity, I want to explain a little bit about Uber so that you understand the challenges and the exciting opportunities. And what does connectivity mean for a company like Uber? And talk about what, what some of the things that we're using as competitive advantages here at Uber. So Uber has completed 10 billion trips. And we are growing 35% year on year on our gross bookings. What that means is the money we make before we give a cut to the drivers. And around 20% year on year net revenue growth. Our Eats business is growing at 108% gross bookings cut before drivers and restaurants. And also growing at around 31% on net revenue. We have around 93 million riders globally. To put it in perspective, that is, this is one third of the population of the United States. And we also have around 33% uh, around 30 growth in our active monthly user. We have around 3 million drivers on our platform. To put it in perspective, we're not an employer, but these are people looking for work on a monthly basis, and we are only surpassed by US Department of Defense, the number of people looking for work on a particular platform. We're in 70 countries, 700 cities, around 22,000 employees worldwide. We also have uh, agents that take your fair queries and questions uh, located in 25 different countries, around 50,000 agents. We have what we call hubs. These are locations where if you want to be a driver, you can go, go up and sign up to be an Uber driver. And I just had to update this number. We are doing around a million concurrent trips uh, every, uh, every moment. So that adds up to 200 trips every second. So that is the kind of connectivity and infrastructure we have to uh, support. What are the product lines? So UberX, this is a flagship product that competes with the taxis around the world. We have UberPool. This is our answer to right, taking carbon off the road. We have Uber Select. These are premium cars. We have Uber Black. These are premium cars with professional drivers. We have Uber XL. These are for large groups. Uber SUV, these are large cars, premium cars with professional drivers. Uber Assist, in a lot, lot of parts of the world, it is actually legal to have a ramp on your taxis. But for example, in London, uh, Jamal actually has Uber as a godsend because he tries to get taxis, but he's not able to because they don't stop for him. Now, they have a product called Uber Assist that he can use to hail uh, his ride. We also have Uber Pet Live in many markets. Uh, these are pet friendly rides. Uber Lite, and unfortunately, the 3G and 4G connectivity is not ubiquitous in a lot of, lots, lot of parts of the world. And we have an um, app that works in 2G. Uh, it's live in countries like India and Brazil. 
very light. We have Uber for business. We sell into your travel departments to automate your expenses, and it automatically goes into your T&E system. Uber reads. So until now, Uber has been in the business of people moving people. So these are drivers moving riders. And then as we build this network, people then asked, can we use this network of people to move things? And the answer was yes. So we started moving things like food. And this business is growing faster than Uber uh, traditional business because probably taxi business is regulated and food industry is not. Uber Freight. This is live in America. One fourth of for, freight is four times bigger con, uh, commuter transportation in America. And it is the lifeblood of America. If you buy a thing from Walmart or Target, you probably have it delivered through freight to the, uh, to the store. And it is still a very traditional business, so to bringing efficiency and using Uber technology to optimize that industry is a huge opportunity. We have Uber Health. One third of US health appointments are, are canceled because patients do not have a way to get to the hospital. And this is a big problem because these are, these are issues for insurance companies as well because prevention is better than cure. So they will pay for you to get to the hospital. And these are, this is a HIPAA compliant platform, web-based platform that we've built for hospitals for them to hail ride for patients. With autonomous vehicles, as you know, driving is one of the biggest killers of human beings in the world. And if we can have a way to make driving safer, uh, it is indeed a noble um, initiative. And it'll, of course, make your ride cheaper as well. We have uh, another business for scooters and bikes. So this is the advent of micro-mobility in cities. For example, if I go from San Francisco downtown to the train station, it will take me around 25 minutes on an Uber ride. But if I take one of these bikes, it's around 12 to 13 minutes. Cut down your time in half in really busy metros. We have Uber Mardo, so somebody will come and pick you up on a bike, and this is live in a lot of Asian cities and preferred mode of transportation for people to get around. We have Uber Boat, this is live in Croatia. You can actually take it on the Adriatic coast. Uh, between uh, Croatia and uh, Venice. We have Uber drones. So we talked about people moving people. And we built this network of people. And we said, can we do people moving things? And the answer was yes. So we built products like Uber, Uber Eats, Uber Freight. And then we said, OK, people are moving people. People are moving things. Can things move people? Probably yes. So that's the advent of businesses like scooters and bikes. These are things moving people in cities. And then we said, can we things move things? Probably. Can we have a drone actually delivering Uber Eats? So these are, these are avenues of how interconnected things have become where it's not only people moving people and things, it's things moving people and things as well. We also have Uber Elevate. This is our Uber Air program. As, as you know, as cities become crowded, we have built skyscrapers because the only way to grow is up. And similarly for transportation, there's, a, there's going to be a saturation in transportation options on the roads. So we feel that the way to go is up. And these are elevated vertical takeoff and landing uh, devices that we are trying to build with partnerships with, across the industry. So this is what we're dealing with. Now, what does connectivity and IoT mean for serving products and services like this? So messaging. So this is super important for Uber because most of these 3 million drivers are on the road trying to serve people like you and me. And when they're on the road, the best way to reach them is actually through messaging. Uh, and SMS is a heavily used medium for us, uh, one of the biggest senders of SMS in the world. And it's a very underutilized medium in this world, and it's pretty effective. So we use it to communicate to our drivers on the road. 
We also use it to communicate to riders in certain markets where it's not highly regulated and you know, heavy, uh, heavy usage for us to reach uh, the end consumer. We also use it for uh, fraud prevention using one-time passwords when you actually log into an app. Uh, we also figured out we're spending a lot of money on messaging and then uh, we partnered with our product team to actually build an in-app chat where you can actually chat with your driver uh, and ri driver can chat with you. We're also a heavy consumer of voice. So we power all the communications between uh, riders and drivers. And also, one of the problems that we faced was if the fraud prevention SMS does not go through, because a lot of people sign up with their landline numbers to join Uber. Uh, as you know, SMS is not delivered to a landline number. So we figured out, we, we figured out a system where you can actually convert text to speech and actually call the landline number to give the code. So hence, powering revenues for uh, Uber. We also have safety as the number one priority for Uber. You know, whenever I travel across the world, one of the biggest problems people talk about is we want a medium that's safe, and especially for women. And we had in, in incidents where we used to expose the phone numbers of riders and drivers, and that used to be a big problem because some of these drivers used to take these numbers and sometimes harass uh, people after the call. So we figured out we should f have a way where people can talk to each other without exposing numbers and figure out a solution where we could anonymize these phone calls that happen between riders and drivers. And then we figured out we are doing billions of minutes on these communication between riders and drivers, and it's become too expensive. And then we uh, invented a Skype-like button on our app and reducing our costs, hence adding to our profitability around 90% on our voice calling between uh, riders and drivers. We also do business in 70 plus countries and we allow drivers to call in to Uber. And what that means is we used to use uh, international toll free numbers for them to call in. But it's, as you know, it's super expensive to have uh, international toll free numbers. And then we went out talked to our partners, got local numbers in these markets. It's important because you need to force that local relationships in each of these markets to make something like that happen. So we have around 50,000 agents worldwide in 25 different countries with 10 different BPO providers helping take support queries for Uber, various products. And our team helps with the whole technology stack that helps with all the contact center things that are required, like workforce optimization, automated call handling, call inbound, outbound calling, um, customer relationship management. So these are things that have to be bleeding edge for us to churn out these 15 million trips a day. So every third trip ends up in some sort of a contact. What that means is either they're contacting the rider or driver or contact centers. Uh, so we really have to be on top so that if you ask a question to our contact centers, they respond within a certain timeline. We also had a problem where Uber drivers were signing up to be Uber drivers, but they were not actually driving. And the drop off was around 20, 30%. And we had a huge call center team that used to just call drivers up saying, hey, I see you sign up, signed up to be an Uber driver, but why are you not driving? And we hacked together an automated uh, calling solution, which eliminated the huge team of these call center people who are calling uh, drivers up, asking why they're not driving. And it actually improved the efficiency and conversion rate of drivers. Because drivers is a huge, imp a driver, uh, we, we consider drivers as supply. And it's a very supply driven market because the more drivers you have, the less ETA you have, the, the less cost it takes for you to take a ride. And so while, while I have many driver product uh, individuals in, in the team, there are very few rider growth uh, individuals because it's a very uh, supply driven, supply growth driven market. We also don't have hard phones at Uber uh, offices anymore. We, and, and let's talk about networks. So there are many networks that we consider within Uber. What we call prime network, this supports our 15 million trips a day that 
the, the one million concurrent trips that can happen. And also, uh, these are networks of six plus data centers and POPs around the world they, that connect the uh, transatlantic uh, connections, transpacific, the dark fiber, the lit fiber, the internet to uh, key uh, locations. We also have corporate networks. We have around 800 offices worldwide. So each of these offices act as uh, our hub for a particular city, and we have connectivity to these offices on a separate network as well. We have hub networks. These are 800 locations worldwide that you can sign up to be an Uber driver. They walk in. They can get uh, papers, documentation done. They can even browse their internet. They can even get a massage in some locations, and these are connected. We have our autonomous car networks. So these are the 300 to 400 self-driving cars that are being tested on the roads in uh, Pittsburgh and few other locations in America. And to put it in perspective, a car going around emits around two terabytes of data. So if you just do the math, two terabytes of data, 300 cars a month, and driving around, let's say, six to eight hours a day, that emits around that's the same amount of data the state of Hawaii consumes in a month. So you can, and you can imagine if that 300 cars become 3,000 or 30,000 or 300,000 or 3 million, it's really a big data problem. How do you, so these are data centers on wheels. They really have a compute stack on the, on the back of the car and they're, they're doing big computations on, um, on these cars. We also have our contact center network that is separate, that's connecting these 25 locations and 50,000 agents. We also do a lot of peering arrangements. This is something where we are, we are bypassing the internet by having a peering relationship with the cloud providers, with the software vendors, and with the telcos so that with, with, with this is this is the benefits of actually uh, not having net ne neutrality too, because you are using um, private connectivity to actually make your app faster. We also have days where using Uber, uh, you probably have noticed surge pricing. So the two busiest days in America are Halloween. I guess people don't like to dress up and drive. And New Year's Eve, people are, pr probably don't like to drink and drive. Now, my bandwidth utilization on these days is 3x. Now, how, how can, I, can I only pay 3x during the surge and not during the rest of the year? So we are talking to companies that can do bandwidth on demand as well. IoT network. So as I mentioned, we are a network right now of people moving things and people and also things moving people and things. So as the things grow and things are moving people and things, we need uh, IoT as the core competitive advantage. And we have a huge IoT network and use cases that are doing bikes and scooters and many other um, use cases at Uber. We also have wireless. We provide uh, cell phones to all our employees, 25,000 employees worldwide. We also have um, internet on the go solutions for employees on the road tr trying to talk to the drivers and power their uh, connectivity. We have wireless connectivity to offices. So sometimes when you start a new office, the procedure is very simple. We hire a general manager for a new city. The general manager hires a operations manager. The operations manager's responsibility is to create supply. And let's say a basic network of 50 drivers in a city to start off. And once that supply is there, the marketing manager is hired. Uh, marketing manager's responsibility is, is to generate demand. There you go, you have supply and demand, a business is born. And sometimes this happens in less than four weeks. And, but as you know, internet connectivity in some of these locations takes six months. So we have some hacks where we try to put together some custom solutions where we can launch an office within a uh, within few weeks, and we rely on uh, wireless connectivity for that.
We also have IoT networks. So this is the layout of a typical self-driving car. You can see the LiDAR on top with the sensors and video sensors. And we also have an IoT modem on top of this car. And without this IoT modem, you really can't locate this car because you cannot really call a driver when it's on self-driving mode. So IoT really is a key component in the self-driving cars. We also have, when in the era of 5G, where, which promises five millisecond latencies and mobile broadband, we have these vehicles, which are self-driving vehicles, going on the road. And we feel a lot of these communications can be done vehicle to vehicle. And in an era where edge computing is also uh, imminent, we feel that we have technologies that have probably 50 to 80% of the compute happening locally and not having it communicate back to our um, data centers. If a self-driving car looks like this, how, what would you do? Would each seat have a Netflix connection? How would you really have that delivered? Would, would, would each of them be a separate pipe? Would each of them be a separate IoT connection or one pipe uh, having Netflix sliced? So these are problems that people need to think about and some people are actively working on. So we had a big problem in Uber Freight, which was in the freight industry, if you're idle, you don't really make money, or in based on your contract, you pay money to for people to sit idle. So sitting idle is really not a good thing in the freight industry. So if a Uber Freight truck comes to a dock, it probably takes three to four hours for undocking. Then what we did was we put an IoT solution on the trailer and had it communicate back to the dock, and that reduced the waiting time by half which means you know, you're giving it back to the shipper not paying too much, or the driver gets paid uh, more for not waiting. We have these mapping vehicles go around 70 to 80 countries around the world, mapping in 3D fashion. And these uh, then go to our agents back uh, in our office, who then scrub this map data, and then put that back into Uber Maps. And IoT solutions powering uh, map collection. We have uh, dash cam based IoT solutions that help with uh, insurance purposes, with, uh, with uh, also safety purposes. And these are IoT based solutions that transmit data. We also have OBD2 dongles based IoT solutions that actually help with usage based insurance and reducing insurance costs. Insurance costs is one of the biggest costs for Uber because they insure, self insure its rights. And Uber figured out we are spending too much money on insurance. Now we formed an insurance entity and the top auto insurers in America. This is how a typical Uber Eats uh, kiosk looks like, a typical restaurant kiosk. Looks like. And you can see all these tablets. And these are all provided by different food delivery apps because they don't want to compete with the real estate on the desktop. And all of these are, are connected. And now usual connection is Wi-Fi. Now, what happens when Wi-Fi goes down? You need some sort of connectivity to help you power, because Wi-Fi is not as ubiquitous in different parts of the world. So hence, if you put a, you know, IoT connection in these tablets, IoT picks up when the Wi-Fi goes down, and hence you're powering revenue for your company. We have these drones fleet managed via IoT. No way to find the drones without IoT. So it's a critical component in actually powering your business, because if you don't does not deliver your food, you'll probably not pay for it. These bikes are also IoT connected. Without these, without these IoT connections, you're not going to find these bikes if you look, open your app uh, in, in a city that the bike is live in. And that's the way we communicate to the bikes. And it's super important for um, to get the connectivity stack right to power your business. Similar with sc scooter fleets as well. These are IoT connected scooters. And also we have technologies that you've got to be aware of because if I'm launching a million bikes and if I'm launching it with a particular telco carrier, what happens when it, when, I, when it comes to the contract expiry time at the end of two years? How much leverage do I have with these uh, companies? Probably none. And so that's why there are certain technologies where if you adopt it, like USCC, you can actually change these telco companies over the air um, for these million bikes after two years if you don't like it. So these are things that you have to take, uh, factor into mind for designing IoT right for your cities, for your countries, for your companies. 
How do you turn it into a competitive advantage as I wrap it up? So there are a lot of these things uh, that we talked about Uber, we talked about what it means to have, what it means to uh, be connected and have IoT uh, in a company like Uber. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, for example, we were trying to launch certain markets like India back in 2013, and we couldn't break into India partly because the smartphone adoption was pretty poor. So no smartphone, no Uber. So now what we had to do was to cut some deals with the telco companies there where you know, we used to probably get a phone for, let's say, $25 with the plan, and we used to give it for drivers for maybe $30. $30. And that powered the business. So you're using connectivity in your partnerships to actually power your business and even start a new uh, big market like India. So this is the network coverage map for you know, the top four carriers in um, USA. And as you know, one of the competitive advantage in the, is, in the telecom industry is your competitors' uh, s uh, s cellular coverage data, which is not self-reported, but which is actual. So Uber has these three million cars around the world that are driving around on different cell networks, and we have live feed data uh, on the self, uh, cell coverage and cell handoff of these different networks. Now, telco companies spend a lot of money uh, on actually finding out the competitors' information and coverage and optimizing their network to that. Now, Uber as a company has this live information can provide it via an API uh, on a, on, on, on a real-time basis to these telco companies around the world, hence using connectivity as a ancillary revenue opportunity and powering um, business uh, for Uber. So connectivity as a competitive advantage. If you think of your company as not just what you do, but also as a network company, um, it, it, it powers a lot of ancillary uh, use cases and opportunities. As you know, if some, some of you who know the SMS industry knows, it, one of the biggest problems in the SMS industry, messaging industry is that we don't know whether the message has been delivered. Because the telcos don't tell you the message has been delivered, they just tell you the SMS has been sent. So in the world of um, messaging, it means there are two things. There's a peer-to-peer -peer messaging, where I'm sending you a message, and there's A to P messaging, where you're sending from an app to a person. So if you have received an SMS from any app, that's called A to P, and that, you know, that is a huge opportunity for telcos whose revenues are flailing. And, but the problem is, you know, the architecture is such that we're not able to find out the delivery, op, uh, delivery uh, receipts. Now, there are technologies out there where if you have an app like Uber installed on your phone, you can, Uber can tell whether an SMS is, any SMS has been delivered to your phone. Uh, so can any of the apps that um, are on, uh, on your phone. And with Uber having 100 million plus users, it's an easy opportunity for us to sell to other SMS companies on a problem that they have not been able to solve uh, using technologies that, that are available and out there, uh, hence driving ancillary revenue opportunities. We also have uh, opportunities where we are actually keeping uh, revenues up, because if Wi-Fi goes down, uh, which used to happen, uh, these restaurants never used to be able to take Uber Eats orders. So no Wi-Fi, no business. And hence, we put IoT uh, sims into these um, uh, tablets, and the Wi-Fi went down, the LTE picked up, and the revenues kept going. So using connectivity really as revenue drivers and cost drivers in a company. So with that thought, let me, let me say that if you think about this cosmos of possibilities out there, when you think about your company as uh, not just what you do, but as having other competitive advantages, and even connectivity in some of your cases for Uber, for example, we have three plus million drivers who are partially utilized. They're not driving for 40 hours a week on Uber platform. Now, if I think of them as a network, can I use half of their time, maybe the rest 50%, on creating a network of, let's say, repair technicians or handymen or gardeners or some other network that they can be utilized for? Then I'm not in transportation business. I'm actually in the labor business. So think, think of all the possibilities that can happen. Now, if you think about all the million-plus bikes out there that are IoT-connected, can I have a little bit of 
cell tower uh, on, on the edge of these devices, hence being an IoT network out there, that, which actually provides infrastructure to various um, telecom companies. So when you think about it like that, when you think about your company as a connected company, you know, the possibilities are endless, and I urge all of you to rethink your business model and come up with um, things that you've probably not thought about. With that, thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'll be outside if you want to talk.